Warm greetings to each and every one of you. My name is Paul André Zurashi. I'm the Archbishop of Gatineau, and this is the 28th episode in a series entitled The Mass Unconfined. In this episode, we want to look at the first Eucharistic prayer, also known as the Roman Canon. This prayer, which is at the heart of the Eucharist as it was celebrated in Rome for many, many centuries, is quite old. Uh, it goes back, at least parts of it, go back to the 4th century. Uh, St. Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan in northern Italy, quotes excerpts from that uh, prayer in towards the year 375 to 400. Um, Pope Gregory I, or Gregory the Great, as he's also known in the year 600, is probably the one who gave it its standard form, or at least under him, the standard form was developed, which was stable for 10 centuries, 13 centuries, up until 1960, approximately. There were little changes made here and there. But at the Council of Trent in the year 1550, approximately, it was decided that this would become the standard Eucharistic prayer for all the churches that were in union with the Bishop of Rome. So all what we call the Western Church or the Latin-speaking Church, the Roman Catholic Church. Other, uh, other traditional churches, the Orthodox churches, the Oriental churches, um, still kept uh, a variety of different Eucharistic prayers. But in the, East, in the Western Church, there was only this one prayer. Uh, in the previous episode, we look at some of the common elements to all the Eucharistic prayers that are presently in the Roman Missal. The, in this talk, I want to look at those elements that are specific to the uh, Roman canon, Eucharistic Prayer 1, as it was published in the new uh, Missal under Paul, Paul VI in 1969. And so one of the things that is noteworthy about this prayer is that there around, uh, how can we say this, the central axis is the story of the institution. I spoke about this in the last episode about how the, we retell the story of Jesus on the night before he died taking the bread and wine. So in this Eucharistic prayer, the part before and the part after, that central part, are equal in length and they kind of double each other. There are elements we find in the first part that we'll find again in the second part. So for example, in both parts we find offerings where we offer these gifts, and we ask God to accept it. So we offer, and we pray that God accept it. And actually, the prayer starts with this. After I'm picking up after the Holy Holy, the priest says, To you, therefore, mer most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts. Uh, so we're, br we're bringing this bread and wine. We present them, and uh, we ask God to accept them. We offer them. I'll go on to that um, a bit after. After the story of the institution, let me find the place here in the Missal, again we present this, we offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life, and the chalice of eternal salvation. So this bread and this wine is an offering. It's the bread of eternal life and the chalice of eternal salvation. We know that and believe that it is the body and blood of Christ. And the prayer goes on to ask God to look upon these gifts with a serene and kindly countenance and to accept them. And uh, there's a beautiful reference here to accept them as the sacrifices of Abel. The, the Abel was the, the son of Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis. The sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the sacrifice of the high priest Melchizedek, the king of Jerusalem, at the time that Abraham's story was being told. These three sacrifices in the book of Genesis were, were a 
accepted by God. They were good sacrifices. And so we refer to them asking God that God accept these sacrifices that we are making, this offering that we are making today. So both before and after, we find an offering asking God to accept. We also find intercessions. Uh, intercessions, we implore God to treat people kindly. And who do we ask God to treat with kindness? Well, first of all, at the beginning of the prayer, we pray for the whole Catholic Church. We pray for your holy Catholic Church, grant her peace, guard her, unite her, and govern her throughout the world. We pray for um, your servant, our Pope, and we name our Pope, right now it's Francis, for our bishop, whoever the bishop of the diocese where the mass is being celebrated is named, and for all those who hold, uh, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. So we're praying for the whole college of bishops here. In naming the Bishop of Rome and the local bishop, we are stating that the Eucharist that we are celebrating is being celebrated in communion with, in unity with, the local bishop, and through the local bishop in unity with the bishop of Rome, the Pope. So we pray for the church, and then we pray for this community, particularly for those who, who have offered the gifts, who've brought up the gifts. Um, in the early church, people would actually bring the bread and the wine, and so we would pray for them, and they'd bring them up in procession. Now, the, the parish supplies us, and we have a few people bring it up, but still there's an echo of this that these gifts come from God's people. I spoke about this in the episode on um, the preparation of the gifts. But this is God's people bringing these gifts. And so we ask God to pray, to watch over, rather, uh, these people. We pray that uh, we offer you this sacrifice of praise, or they offer it for themselves and for those who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls and the hope of health and well-being as they pay their homage to you. And finally, we also pray, okay, so that's before. We've prayed for the whole church. We've prayed for this community. And after the institution narrative, we will pray again a prayer of petition for those who have died. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the peace of, uh, and rest in the sleep of peace, Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. So we ask God to receive those who have died in uh, God's mercy. So before and after, we have these prayers of petition. What else do we have that is repeated? We have uh, the naming of saints. We pray in communion with the saints. And this is really interesting here, as I, I've been saying that the Mass is unconfined. The, the Mass is not closed in on itself. We've just prayed for the whole universal church. But beyond that, we are celebrating in union with the Church of Heaven. And so we name this before the institution narrative. We pray in communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. And then we name Joseph, her spouse, and your blessed apostles and martyrs. We always name Peter and Paul, Andrew. Peter and Paul are the two apostles who are buried in Rome. Andrew is the patron saint of Constantinople and of the Orthodox Church. And so in a way, by naming Andrew, we're saying we are in union, not just with the Church of Rome, but with our brothers and sisters of the Orthodox Churches who share the fullness of faith with us. And we can name, there's a list of, of other saints, the rest of the apostles, James and John and Thomas, James and Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon and Jude. And then we name a few of the Roman martyrs. As I said, this was the prayer. This prayer was developed in Rome. It's the Roman canon. So we name the Roman martyrs. Uh, the first of the martyrs were actually the first bishops of Rome, the first popes, Linus and Cletus and Clement and Sixtus and Cornelius, and we name others, um, priests and deacons and, and laymen, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John and Paul, Cosmas and Damian, and all your saints. And we ask that through their prayers and merits and all things, we may be defended. So we've named 
the communion of the saints, we will also name it after the institution narrative. We go to, we pray to us also, your servants, who, though sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, mercies, graciously grant some share in fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs. And so here we name John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, and Barnabas. Matthias, if you recall, was the one who was um, elected to replace Judas among the twelve. Barnabas was the companion of Paul, and Paul and Barnabas were called apostles. But we also can name a number of other martyrs from the Roman Church. Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, and for those who worry that we've only named men up to now, seven women. Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Um, I invite you to go find these names on the internet and read their stories. They're actually quite remarkable stories of faithfulness, of bravery, of commitment, even unto death. These are remarkable men and women who marked the history of the early church. We have to remember that in Rome, the martyrs were venerated to the point where they would, uh, the people would gather uh, in, uh, in the catacombs where they were buried, where these saints were buried. They would gather on their tombs to celebrate the Eucharist in memory of them. And so we've seen how before and after there are all these prayers. I'd like to point out also two invocations. An invocation is a, a calling down God's blessing. And it happens twice, once before and once after the institution narrative. Let's take a look before. Be pleased O oh God, we pray to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. So we ask God to bless this offering, to make it spiritual and acceptable so that it may become for us the body and blood of our most beloved, of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. So it is through God's action that the bread and wine are transformed into the body and blood of Christ. So we call for God to intervene, to bless. Um, in the Roman canon, the Holy Spirit is not named explicitly. The Spirit will be named in the other Eucharistic prayers. But in this prayer, it is, it is understood that it is through the Spirit that God is acting here. Uh, though the Spirit is not named. So that's before the institution uh, narrative. And after, we will find this prayer. Let me find it. Um, in humble prayer, we ask you, Almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty. This is a beautiful metaphor here. There's There's a feeling that this liturgy that we are celebrating here on earth is connected in a mystical way to the eternal liturgy that is ongoing in heaven. And so there's, we imagine an altar in heaven. There is no altar in heaven, but we use that imagery of an altar being in heaven and we ask God to send his angel to connect our offering with that offering in heaven. And the prayer concludes so that all of us through this participation at the altar, receive the most holy body and blood of your Son and may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. So that now the invocation is on us. We ask God to bless us so that we will be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. I'd just like to uh, point out one final thing about this prayer is right after the institution narrative is what we call the anamnesis or the remembering. The congregation, the assembly, proclaims an anamnesis when the priest says the mystery of faith and we say, we proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. The priest takes up that prayer and he continues, Therefore, O Lord, we celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection of the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ, your Son, our Lord. So again, we, we situate what we are doing as a memorial of the great mystery of our faith 
that in dying and in rising, Jesus has worked out our salvation. And so we continue, we present to you uh, in this memory that we make, we present from the many gifts you've given us this pure victim. Uh, so we see how the Roman canon is really a beautiful prayer. It's constructed with a bunch of short prayers that are kind of balanced before and after the, the institution narrative where we tell how Jesus the night bef before he died, he took the bread and the wine. And these echoes kind of uh, set up a whole process of praise, of uh, exhortation or invocation rather, and also of petition that we present towards God. It's a beautiful and rich prayer. It's too bad we don't use it more often. It's a bit longer than the others. Maybe that's why we don't use it as often, but we should. It is, uh, how can we say, uh, a part of our patrimony as the Western Church. It is the prayer that was our Eucharistic prayer for many, many centuries, and it still has great value and beauty in the Eucharistic celebration that we, um, that we enact today as the people of God. In the next uh, episodes, I will be looking at Eucharistic prayers 2, 3, and 4, and I invite you to join me uh, in the next few days. God bless.